Hello, welcome again to our course, Policies in Bilingualism and Learning Environments. During the second module, we will address the following question. How to understand the concept of language education policies from a comparative perspective? To answer this, we have explored during the written module the basic concepts of language education policy, national and international ones, and indigenous policies those from Latin America and perspective considering some of international references we have. However, during this video we will focus on the policies in our country. Before starting, let's refresh some of the definitions we explained before. Let's start by the definition of language policy. Many experts have tried to explain what a language policy is. Kaplan and Baldov established that by means of a language policy, a means of instruction was chosen and this determined all the main aspects and processes of acquisition and learning of a language. This is how the policy was directed, mainly towards the modification of the syllabus, curriculum, methods, material, assessment and evaluation. The economic resources are also important in a nation. Likewise, it determines the way in which future teachers are trying to carry out language teaching and learning processes. On the other hand, Homberger and Johnson in 2007 stated that educational policy could be understood from the perspective of a layered model. In other words, the policy had to be planned, created, implemented and evaluated from the different national, institutional and international processes. Therefore, and retaking this position, we could say that a language competence becomes an important factor to evaluate a language policy. And if we retake what Johnson says, that the definition of language policy could be completed with a mechanism that imparts the structure, function, use or acquisition of a language, we analyze that actually this construction of linguistic competences cannot be perceived as an isolated process where each competence is evaluated separately or by making comparisons between the native who use the evaluated or tagged language in their monolingual community. As teachers, we cannot ignore that other languages that coexist in the student's context, their knowledge and the influence of other languages and their use in different learning environments can even be penalized. Others, like Erdosia, emphasizes that the need uh, to see a language as a communicative act and discourse which is fluid, dynamic and complex in which results is never finalized or complete is also necessary to comprehend this concept of language policy. The author defines language as a repertoire of semiotic devices, where communication takes place at the mercy of the speaker and in which mass media plays a fundamental role. We invite you to check our main document for Module 2 in which you will find other aspects to consider in the process of planning and analyzing a language policy. Now, we will talk about the Colombian perspective. The teaching and learning of English in a general of foreign languages in Colombia has been marked by foreign theories and learning methods. According to Bonilla Carvajal and Tejada Sanchez, the integration of the English foreign language into our national education system has experienced different transitions and policies which have intended to make teaching and learning English more technical, scientific and efficient. Also, they affirm that this historical and political process has developed some rules that in some cases have promoted the implementation of policies that do not obey the epistemological nature of learning or teaching a foreign language, but the political and social development of the country, which is not entirely bad, but which set an objectified trend in the process. Making a chronological analysis of the policies in Colombia, we can go back until the colonial period. According to Gómez Sara and Rico, in the 17th and 18th centuries, Spanish was established as the official language and it was imposed in the indigenous communities. By that time, there were 101 
indigenous languages in our territory, and most of them belong to Chipcha, to Konoa, Bora, Witoto, among others. However, we already had a multilingual context because in many private schools, the language taught were mainly Latin, Greek, and Spanish. Usma also stated that actually one of the languages that is spread the most in the country was French, which was considered the culture and society language. After the Second World War, countries were in need to reconstruct their economies and nations, and at the same time, the U.S. was positioning as a great world power, economic and linguistically speaking, with its English language. According to Gonzalez, it may have occurred because of the economic expansion, social, political and economic influence and technological development of the United States. In the 70s, 80s and 90s, Latin American countries strengthened pedagogical and didactic competencies and Colombia was not the exception. The country started to grow apart from religious paradigm and it privileged the language and scientific discourse in reference to the implementation of educative policies and the teaching in foreign languages. At that moment, the English language was most related to the North American culture, and so this language suffered a process of denationalization that led towards a longer franca, and a low communication among people from different nationalities and origins apart from their mother tongue. The Colombian government, and actually many of them along with America, implemented various policies and strategies to improve the teaching and learning of languages in Colombia, especially the English language. In 1982, Usma refers to a policy called the English Syllabus, which was created which was created between the National Ministry of Education and the British Council. Unfortunately, there was not a success in that policy, mainly resumed by USMA because teachers lacked the sufficient oral skills, second, there was not enough instruction time in the curriculum, and classes did not modify their didactics. After the years, in 1991, we had a new political constitutional reform, and three years later, on February 8, 1994, the men launch the 115 general law of education. According to USMA, this law recognized the whole school system and established specific goals for foreign language in the country because it proposed the curricular guidelines for the inclusion of foreign languages in the curriculum. But in words of the same USMA, the poor working conditions, the poor materials, resources, and the lack of teachers inhibited the development of the proposal. This law was later modified by Law 1651 in 2013, which added articles to the general law of education according to the national government. It gave a more relevant role to the acquisition of a foreign language in all the levels of education in Colombia and prioritize the teaching of English in the public educational institutions of the country without disregarding the wide variety of indigenous languages spoken in the national territory. And finally, we have the first version of the National Bilingualism Plan, which was launched in 2001 stating as the main objective to assist to a particular bilingualism necessities of the different Colombian populations while considering the multiculturalism of the nation. In the words of Mejia, this plan included the ethnic education which intended to provide indigenous communities with bilingual education in their native language and Spanish, but at the same time, it promoted the inclusion of the common European framework of references for languages as the international reference for the creation of curricula. Along the time, these bilingualism programs have received some critics about their goals and strategies, the main of them are related to the educational problems that the territory has in basic education, in which many gaps exist between urban and rural education, and between public and private education too. 
The main question of the experts inquire if the country is ready for bilingualism in which Spanish and English are prioritized. Other suggestions are mainly stated by Gomez Ara, Bonilla Carvajal, Bonilla Lopez and Cárdenas Anusma, stating that teachers, according to the program, must continue with a diagnosis and training of teachers in language and methodologies, but only teachers with a level English of B2, according to the Common European Framework, are hired in public schools. Another suggestion is the necessity that native speakers of English don't be prioritized to teach the 9th, 11th or 10th grades in the schools. In public schools, for example, there are not bilingual teachers in most of the primary levels courses. That is something that we need to improve too. And the graduate programs for training teachers in English must ensure that some of their teachers are native speakers of English. That is a requirement for the Ministry of, of the Education. So, along with this brief historical travel, it has been demonstrated that although the new discourse, policies and practices, and linguistic policies, not all the efforts have empowered enough the learning of English as a foreign language in the country. On the contrary, the idea to turn into a bilingual country has become an utopia. The creation of such policies that impose the learning and teaching of English in the country exhibit a low recognition of the cultural characteristics of our country, as well as the marginalization of proper communities and languages that exist in our territory. Finally, we invite you to analyze these perceptions and to compare them to what is currently happening in our country, region, or even in your school.